Thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. It's an honor to be with you and to introduce a panel on irregular democracy. I think we can all agree that gatherings like the Sedona Forum, where Americans from all backgrounds can rally around fundamental values like democracy and strong American leadership, have only grown more important in recent years. These are ideals we all share, whether we have an R next to our name or a D. When you all read in the news about how evil the other side is, it can be easy to forget that we still hold so much in common. And I'm grateful to the McCain Institute for bringing us back together. Unfortunately, we have many pressing national security challenges on top of our divisions here at home. We can no longer ignore the threat China's global ambitions pose to our security and our very way of life. Rogue countries like Iran and North Korea are continuing to test the limits of what they can get away with, whether that means sponsoring terrorism or using more advanced nuclear programs. And Russia is behaving more boldly. Just in the last few months, they have threatened American troops in the field, continued to build up forces on their border with Ukraine and in the Arctic, and imprisoned Putin critic Alexei Navalny on false charges. It's going to take a concerted, decades-long effort from both parties if we want to preserve America's place as the global leader and the rules-based international order we have done so much to create. But we have a secret weapon that these other nations don't have, democracy. Democracy in America means, among many other things, free elections, free speech, and free people. But American democracy has always meant standing up for the oppressed around the world as well. It means supporting lovers of freedom everywhere, regardless of whether they were born within our borders. It means siding with Americans at heart, like Navalny, who Putin fears so much that he won't even say his name out loud. His vision of a free Russia, of a Russia that would look not unlike the country we are so lucky to call home, should inspire us all to be grateful that we already enjoy those freedoms. We are far from perfect, but we should never forget how fortunate we are to call ourselves Americans. I hope we will remember that as we move forward. We are deeply divided, but we don't have to stay that way forever. We can all choose to put gratitude before grievances common ground before conflict, and forgiveness and mercy before moral outrage. That is what it's going to take to remain at the top, but it's up to each of us to choose that path and reject the one that we're on. It won't be easy, but we've come out of worse spots than this before. And if there's one lesson that the history of the last few centuries has taught us, it's this, do not bet against America. Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor-at-large of The Hill, and we are very grateful to the Sedona Forum, the McCain Institute, and particularly to Cindy McCain, to being interested in those contours of diplomacy that, that, that aren't the normal ones. We're gonna talk about irregular diplomacy today with three extraordinary hands who've played all sides uh, of the diplomatic channel. Uh, we have with us General Joe Votel. Uh, he's a retired four-star general, once uh, common, uh, commander of uh, Special Operations Command, but also US Central Command. He is now the president and CEO of Business Executives for National Security. Knew Senator McCain very, very well as I think all of our panelists have, Derek Mitchell, Ambassador Derek Mitchell. Um, I don't know if he was our first, but he was our first in a long time, Ambassador to Burma. Uh, I had the pleasure of knowing him when he was 
uh, head of Southeast Asia initiatives at CSIS. He's held senior positions at the Department of Defense, and he's now president of the National Democratic Institute. But Burma is another place where extraordinary diplomacy uh, surrounded then the opening of Burma and the normalization of relations with Burma. And it's now back, of course, in the news big time with lots of complexities, which I'm sure we'll get into. And then Ambassador David Pressman. Uh, David is currently a partner at Jenner and Block, but he was U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations for special political affairs, and he represented the United States uh, at the U.N. Security Council. Uh, he's held lots of positions, senior leadership roles in homeland security. He was director of war crimes at the National Security Council and has, as all of our uh, uh, panelists have real background on human rights issues, war crimes issues, uh, and whatnot. Our job today is to really dissect and play and tug uh, with this notion of irregular diplomacy. What I want to put in my uh, uh, in, in this to begin with, because I think it is a term that is evolving. I don't think it's strictly defined by many folks, but I would share that there was a time when after Bill Clinton was elected, at that moment when President Clinton was being elected, um, Boris Yeltsin's government and Russia in general were melting down. And former President Nixon was obsessed with this issue. Uh, he and, he and uh, Bill Clinton talked about it and they decided that Japan, which had still significant, had significant problems with Russia, still had never resolved its issues after World War II with Russia, nonetheless was the nation with as much discretionary capital laying around at that time and had to be the nation that did something to help Russia. Bill Clinton sent a letter with all people, but Richard Nixon to meet with then Prime Minister Miyazawa. I organized parts of this trip and he succeeded. And this was as close to irregular diplomatic channels as I had come to in a serious way. John McCain knew every step of this trip, every element of it, and it ended up succeeding uh, with this Japanese financial instrument given to Russia. So I just wanted to put that out there that stuff happens and there are very interesting dimensions. It's not just Dennis Rodman uh, in North Korea or President Trump's tweets, there's a wide range. But let's start, um, David Pressman, Ambassador Pressman, if you could share with us this, um, the, the contours of irregular diplomacy as you see it, how we have a lot of institutions, intelligence institutions, diplomatic institutions, military institutions, engaged with lots of the conventional promulgation of US interests in the world. But how do you define irregular diplomacy uh, and maybe give us a couple of examples. Yeah, thanks, Steve. It's it's great to be here and great to be connected with old friends like Derek and, and General Bodel. Nice to nice to meet you. Um, you know, I think I, I think you know. Just a few weeks ago, I don't know if you you caught Secretary Blinken's remarks on Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Remembrance Day, but they were really profound. I thought, and in it, he described the banality of diplomatic cables and language that. State Department foreign service officers were using in the context of World War II and the sort of sanitized nature of what they were saying as being cover for the genocide that was unfolding. And, and he noted that the same tools, the same cables, the same instruments in the hands of individuals who have convictions and are equipped with truth and fact can be used to save lives. Um, and it resonated with me as I was thinking about our panel here today, because I think, you know, coming off of my experience working, representing the United States, the United Nations Security Council, which is, of course, the body mandated with maintaining international peace and security, but doing so at a time where you had a permanent member of that council, a veto wielding member of the Russian Federation, actually invading and purportedly annexing another country. The space for sort of the traditional avenues of leverage mm. of the council was was very limited. And so you were looking for irregular or new ways to sort of reroute the Security Council in the day to day problems that the world was confronting. And for us, that often took the form of trying this sort of unnatural act of trying to connect the Security Council to human beings lives. Um, and, you know, just by way of example, one of, the, one of the issues that was uh, appropriately at the forefront of our, of our time on the council was North Korea. And I spent a lot of time negotiating with the Chinese on nuclear activity in the Korean Peninsula and what have you. But what was marked was that it, while the nuclear activity was very much at the forefront of the council's agenda, sort of the other weapon of mass destruction of Kim Jong-un, which was the way he was treating his own people and the way he is treating his own people, was nowhere to be found. And so while you have 
hundreds of thousands of people in forced labor camps and you have him starving his own people to feed his nuclear program, the Security Council as such was squarely focused on nukes. And so one of the things that we tried to do was to expand the aperture of how the Security Council was engaging on North Korea to include the human rights situation in North Korea. And, mm. um, you know, I, I remember, I remember, I'm sure Derek has stories like this as well, but I remember when I was at dinner with the Chinese ambassador, my, my interlocutor, and I raised with him over sort of dessert, you know, we, we're, the United States is planning to try and introduce the human rights situation as an agenda item in North Korea. I, I still remember like the spoon dropping and, and the, 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 the meal pausing. Um, but of course we went on and we were able to successfully overcome the Chinese procedural vote and add the human rights situation in North Korea to the council's agenda. And, and I raised that as an example of trying to take institutions that are stuck in many respects, reconnect them with human, human lives, human security, not mm -hmm. just international peace and security. And to me, irregular diplomacy is about effective means of doing that, of effectively advancing our interests in new ways using old institutions. Ambassador Mitchell, Derek Mitchell, can you uh, jump on this as well? And you know, as we uh, look at this kind of challenge we have today of talking about irregular diplomacy, how regular is irregular diplomacy in your world? I mean, to what degree is what we're talking about really a boutique in the operation, but maybe important, um, but, but I, I just kind of give people a sense of the gauge of when it matters and you know, to how, how prevalent um, this kind of irregular outreach um, and, and, and tactic is used. Right. Well, again, thank you to the Sedona Forum for inviting me. And um, it seems to me this is the most McCain-like of topics. Uh, he was an irregular <laughs> politician. This is a regular diplomacy. And, and just like uh, Senator McCain, I, I think he, he thought about what do we need to get done and how do we best go do it, um, both protecting American interests and American values at the same time. And I don't know that, I mean, I, when I heard this topic, as you know, Steve, I wondered what it meant. Um, what is it to be irregular diplomacy? Because really you should be at all times using every tool you have at your disposal uh, in order to advance your interest. So that can be governmental, it could be non-governmental, it could be NGOs, it could be business, it could be, um, it could be the State Department, which is traditionally considered the center of diplomacy, or it could be the Defense Department or Capitol Hill. And uh, of course there are senators that can go out there and do this work. Uh, but it really is looking at every situation in its context and determining what it is that will make a difference and get the other side to do what you want them to do in your interest. So um, that can mean though, I think there is true, a traditional diplomacy, I suppose, or regular diplomacy can be viewed as, you know, the guys in the starched, you know, outfits start suits to go out there and they deliver talking points dutifully and they get their demarches back and they report them. Um, and they, they just hit their marks or it could be about shaping. And there are different ideas about this, I suppose, but I, you know, it depends on the diplomat. I think diplomacy is not irregular if you're out there um, trying to shape an environment that is consistent with our interests using every tool, uh, using um, a former president, uh, somebody who's trusted by the leadership to go and, and, and deliver a message. Um, so I saw that, I did that. I, I mean, I was in a foreign service officer. Uh, I was an ambassador first before I was a diplomat. <laughs> Um, and I don't know what regular diplomacy is, I guess. I did what I did the way I did it. Um, and whether it was regular or irregular, I don't know. But to me, using every tool at your disposal that you've got um, should be standard procedure in the US government and not be sort of proprietary or insular because you are the ones who, uh, who own this. And I, I think there needs to be more of that cross governmental and um, cross societal type of uh, diplomatic activity. Uh, thank you, General. Um, we saw particularly during the um, Obama administration, particularly in round one of the Obama administration, a lot of effort by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to, to really talk about the role of diplomacy, the kind of key statutory role um, that diplomats played in areas of conflict around the world. And Defense Secretary Bob Gates supported that. He said, you know, we need to put more resources uh, into diplomacy, but there is a de facto reality out there that America's uh, military capacity, intelligence capacity globally is substantial and is often where, um, uh, you know, we get traction and grit. So I'd love to get your 
um, thoughts on this, not on diplomacy, but just you know America's extension of its interests um, as, as a com combatant commander uh, in two key commands. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, first off, it's great to be with you and with my fellow colleagues here. And, and my thanks to the Sedona Forum and Cindy McCain for the invitation to be here today. I, I think you raise a really, uh, really uh, interesting point. And uh, I, I definitely think this is the case, particularly in the areas in which I have spent most of my time serving, which, as you would expect, is in the Middle East. Um, and uh, it, there was no doubt that it was with, uh, with a number of countries there that uh, the relationship with the military, uh, to some extent, was, was a door opener and provided access. Uh, I, I know on, on several occasions, particularly in, in nations where we had chargés, as opposed to confirmed ambassadors, that uh, the presence of the combatant commander, my presence, I think very much became an enabler for the charge to get access to people in the host nation government that they uh, otherwise were somewhat challenged to. So I, I think there definitely is something to this. Uh, and, I, and that to me is a very positive aspect of, of the military here, that it can help with uh, some of the countries that are perhaps more hierarchical, uh, look more to their military military, to the security forces uh, for this, that uh, that can be a, a way of doing it. I do think it has some downsides, of course. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things I, as I, as I reflect back on the on my role as the CENTCOM commander and the things that we were dealing with is that the, 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 the downside of all is that is that it does have a does have a tendency of, of over militarizing our approach um, to things. You know, you, we've heard it, uh, Hera said, if everything, uh, you know, if, 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 you're, if everything looks like a nail, then you're just always hitting, hitting hammers with it, using a hammer to pound it in. You, you got, I think, uh, the, the downside of this, of course, is that, you know, th there are limits to what the military can do in terms of, of, some, of some of these diplomatic type of things. And so I think we have to recognize that, and you do have to figure out the balance. And, and I do absolutely agree with Secretary Gates's uh, viewpoint, and frankly, that of uh, probably several uh, secretaries of defense that followed him. Uh, Secretary Mattis was, was, was particularly uh, stringent on this, that, you know, that if, if we are not supporting uh, our diplomatic corps, then we need to we we will we will end up relying more on our military uh, to do things. So I think there is a certainly a balance. There are certainly some uh, advantages to this where we can leverage it, uh, but there are also I think uh, real detractors that we have to be aware of. You know, just to 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 be um, avant garde for a moment, all of you have uh, been in very important diplomatic positions, and I think one of the areas I'd love to just kind of see what you think is that it has occurred to me that in years past, not recently and not in the last four years, but previous to that, groups like the American Advancement uh, Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, you know, we're sort of putting together, I was involved with it, putting in, you know, science missions to Cuba, science missions to Syria, science missions to Iran that were apolitical, allegedly, um, but yet leading scientists, in fact, one of these people from Texas Instruments later became Colin Powell science advisor, the first sci science advisor to a secretary of state. And it just made it seem to me, and you go back and look at Nixon days, ping pong diplomacy uh, with China uh, or the role of sports. But I'm just interested in whether as we think about, you know, reaching out and moving a country. And the other, the other part of this is, you know, I was asking myself, you know, is, is irregular diplomacy more effective on autocrats and tyrants than it is on well-developed democracies and Alec Angela Merkel or a, you know Justin Trudeau. So I'm just interested in any thoughts. You know, David, do you you know as you have you kind of run into in, into cases where science or maybe in the human rights area NGO activity as opposed to classic um, uh, uh, work done within diplomatic channels that NGOs of various kinds can play a key role uh, in the sorts of goals we have when it comes to foreign policy and national security. Yeah, I mean, thanks for the question. I, I, I have in that, you know, before entering government um, as a human rights lawyer, this is, this is what I did. I was trying to move the people who were ultimately in the positions that I, I served in. And, um, you know, there was a reason why, at least I thought it was effective in the run up to the last Beijing Olympics to lead a delegation of gold medal Olympians uh, to Beijing and mm -hmm. makers to Beijing to talk to China and then move, go on to Cairo to talk to the Egyptians about what was unfolding at the time in Sudan. 
And, and the reason why we thought that was important and that was an important vehicle in is that while the message from the United States government and official actors on behalf of the United States government could be very clear that dimensionalizing that with other costs for not performing, for not, respons mm. for, for not responding, cultural costs associated with that could help render choices that capitals were having to make more stark it's the same, you know, it's similarly um, in, in the context of Darfur, I remember cl clearly with, with Elie Wiesel, who of course has now since passed away, but Elie Wiesel mm -hmm. and George Clooney and putting them in front of the Security Council to talk about the unfolding atrocities in Darfur. And the, the, the rationale behind that was that Ambassador Bolton, who was then the, the US ambassador to the UN, could speak with, with one voice, but the, the, the amount of attention and heat that we could bring by bringing these unlikely interlocutors to the conversation was something that we thought was really effective. And that's true from a government perspective as well. I think Ambassador Mitchell made the point, like I, I, I very much agree that we shouldn't consider this irregular. I think it's mm -hmm. when serving these roles, it's your responsibility to find who is the interlocutor? What is the message that is most meaningfully gonna move the, the party you're trying to move? And there's, there's countless examples in that, you know, that, that where, where you can think of the private sector or you can think of the Catholic church or whoever it is that's gonna be much more, in a much stronger position to have a message resonate with an individual, especially when you're dealing with situations of peace and security where often you have an individual who's not behaving rationally and you want to be able to deliver messages and connect with that individual in ways that are that in a moment of, of intensity and of high risk. And I can think of, you know, whether it's in Burundi or, or elsewhere where you, connecting with the church, connecting with the business executives can have a really profound, a much more profound effect in some instances than official statements from Washington. You know, I, I, I would just, before I jump to Derek, I, you know, just thinking again about Senator John McCain and some of the things that he did, I constantly saw him, you know, on Co Codell's and, and various things. But when you think about the fact that what you said is so important that there may be foreign policy or national security strategists that want to deploy this irregular method or this, you know, character, or this sports star. Well, they also wanted to deploy Senator John McCain and Senator John Kerry then on Vietnam normalization, right? They were the two key pieces in that discussion, uh, in my book anyway, of helping to normalize relations both politically at home and abroad. So they, again, it, it didn't follow a conventional track and they, they readily participated in that. Is, that. is that pretty close to what you were saying, David? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and you know, General Vogel and the Business Executives Network, what have you, I mean, when we were confronting, you know, domestic criminalization of LGBT status laws in a range of countries, in the government, we were reaching out to business executives who, were, who had plants and operations and, and investments in those countries and asking them to help us make calls to governmental leaders to try and stave off some of the, mm. the more odious stuff. Because not because the U.S. didn't have a voice, we used our voice, but because mm. it was much bigger than government to government interaction. And I think that wow. that is the reality of how we have to operate in this environment we're in. Important, Derek, Mitchell? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what we're saying is the foundation of diplomacy or getting, getting something done is trust. If you have trust or you have relationships that are, that are there, um, you wanna leverage that. You look for every tool you have to leverage that trust. So the reason why you turn to a John McCain or a John Kerry in Vietnam is because they had spent many, many years engaged in Vietnam and they had built, they had a legacy, of course, from, from bad times of 30, 40, 50 years ago, but, but also built up a certain amount of trust with the leadership and uh, you deploy them in order to uh, uh, get things done in ways that maybe formal diplomats don't have that same level of personal engagement. We can have a frank conversation. What you wanna do is have a very frank, transparent, honest conversation, um, tactfully, that can move your interlocutor for whoever will get you that. And, and look, we can turn right now even to my old country where I was ambassador Myanmar and Burma, which I imagine might get to. I'm thinking today of what would move the generals more than other generals. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they may not care what diplomats think, but if there are good relationships between uh, generals, not that anything might move them at this point because they may be lost uh, in their own evil ways, but, um, but they care 
what other generals think, probably more than any diplomat does. So if you get other generals to tell them, we don't respect you, we think you are, this is so disrespectful. I mean, anyone who does this kind of activity, you'll never get our respect. You get people that they respect saying that to them, that will matter. So that you call that irregular diplomacy or creative diplomacy. I mean, it's the way it should always have been done. I mean, in the 50s, we had jazz, right? We had jazz ambassadors who would go mm -hmm. over. Uh, that's where soft power is all about, so-called irregular diplomacy of um, building connections between our cultures and our peoples that had ways of tearing down barriers and making it easier to have the hard conversations. Uh, we need more of this. We tore down the US Information Agency after the Cold War, and we are paying a desperate price for it while you're finding the Chinese doing it terribly, but at least they recognize they don't, the, the value of that kind of thing. So um, yes, I think there's a lot more creativity that can go into this realm, more, more resources can go into this realm to get us, I think, in a, in a moment where we're under, uh, have much more, um, uh, much more competition in the world, we really need this more than ever, frankly. General Votel, your thoughts, and do you want to catch yeah. a plane to Southeast Asia? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. By the way, but uh, no. Thanks. I, I think this is a really, uh, really good discussion, and uh, I really like the like how we're how we're proceeding with this. But I want to pick up on this nonprofit angle that uh, that uh, was mentioned a little bit earlier. The, the organization I lead now, Business Executives for National Security, we have actually we have actually done this. Uh, when I was a CENTCOM commander, we invited a team of. Uh, private sector uh, senior executives to come in and help us uh, help us work through the situation that was created between Saudi Arabia the Emirates and Qatar uh, back in the 2016 time frame when uh, 17 time frame when uh, when the rift began there and to try to make the case uh, help us understand the business case and and see if there was an angle that they could connect on with uh, with the leadership uh, we did that in conjunction with our you know with our diplomats on the ground and and really with a lot of support from the from the host nations unfortunately it, it didn't result in any particular changes and that kind of lingered. But uh, I do think this aspect of nonprofit organizations, civil organizations coming out and doing things is, is really important. I know in a place like Northern Syria, for example, where we did not have a strong USAID or other kinds of programs in place, we relied on organizations like Spirit of America, for example, to come in and bring uh, needed supplies and, uh, and uh, resources uh, to people in, in great need. Uh, and another really good example I saw of this was with an organization known as America, uh, America Abroad Media, uh, which basically uh, took uh, directors and producers from Hollywood and helped uh, host nation uh, individuals tell the story. Uh, this was used extraordinarily effectively in places like Jordan and Lebanon, particularly at the height of the, of the war against uh, of our conflict with ISIS here to help uh, help address this idea of, home, of, of uh, radicalization and extremism that was taking place in these countries. This was very, very effectively, very, very effective. I mean, the, the series that America Broad Media did in Lebanon was, was uh, I think, the number one rated uh, a series uh, for a period of time in, in that country. It got that much attention. So there is real power in the civil community to, to work in conjunction with uh, uh, the, you know, our diplomatic corps and certainly the military to, uh, to really bring these capabilities to bear for, for really good purposes, I believe. You know, I'm really glad you mentioned American Abroad Media because I want to kind of broaden our discussion in another element. It may be discussed in other sessions, but it, you know, it makes me think there's one thing to talk about irregular diplomacy, but there's another thing to talk about irregular communications. And when you sort of look at America Broad Media, but you look at what, you know, our State Department and uh, David and, and Derek, you may be more acquainted with what our tools and tactics are than I am. But when I look at young people that I'm interacting and sometimes hiring, interviewing today, you know, they're on TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, as the president was, President Trump was. And there's a whole new ecosystem of communication and influence out there um, that is both uh, uh, disconcerting in some ways, but it also has some uh, uh, elements that I sort of look at as, as opportunities for diplomacy, at least for communication about what our interests um, are. And I'm interested in to what degree, David, 
because you're so much in that human rights space, whether or not we need to have a readjustment or adjust a little bit our, our, the way we think about the tools we use uh, and look at some of these other platforms that I have to tell you uh, from recent talks with State Department friends, I, I don't really see them moving that direction too quickly. <laughs> Well, I, I think that's happening. I mean, I, I, government moves government moves in in, in perhaps slow ways, but I, I think that there's a broad recognition, mm. uh, certainly at the State Department and and in, in, the, in the in the government as a whole, that the the, the modes of communicating and of connecting with um, populations in, in countries around the world has changed, and that we need to do a better job of using it. I, I think there's a little ham-fistedness often associated with how mm. we've gone about it. And maybe that's to your point, Steve, and that's something that needs to be improved. But but part maybe, of it, maybe we should make you a human rights influencer and move you around oh. as an influencer. <laughs> uh, if you can do that in the next 15 minutes. That would be impressive. But um, no, I mean, I think, look, I think that um, that part of the challenge is our message, right? I mean, is that diplomats, um, diplomats are trained to speak in carefully curated language that um, you know, diplo speak um, and using a lot of words that doesn't necessarily communicate with specificity um, what what the core message might be. And, and that doesn't translate well on Twitter. Mm. And I think that in the previous administration, I mean, sir, you, you mentioned President Trump's tweets and what have you. There was certainly, you know, the, the president and, and partisanship aside, the president made a decision that he was going to open up channels of dialogue, including with the American people, that were irregular, irregular and that they had never happened before. Mm -hmm. um, and whether they were effective or right, I'll leave for others to discuss, but um, you better believe that, that other governments were taking advantage of that. I mean, if you mm -hmm. were looking at where other capitals were focused on spending their time in terms of how to get messages to the White House, I can almost assure you in the previous administration, as much time was spent trying to discern who was going to be on Fox and Friends as was what was going to go into a diplomatic cable. And that was because it was viewed, I think, appropriately as a path to reach the Oval Office. And so, you know, as we open up these channels, these irregular channels of both communication with the United States government, but also how we engage with others, I think we need to do so mm. with care um, and hopefully with respect to our public diplomacy efforts with additional sophistication. Derek, your thoughts on, on some of these irregular channels of communication and where they fit in. Um, but I also want to just add, add to this. It occurred to me recently in the Quad meeting of the leaders of the United States, Japan, India, and Australia, that Derek Mitchell laid the groundwork for that about a decade and a half ago. I just want to give you credit. And I won't call that irregular, but you didn't do it in the government. You did it outside government. So I don't know if I'm inappropriately giving you credit for it, but you do deserve credit for it. <laughs> Wow. Well, to be very honest, you're the first one to say this. I was doing a U.S.-India dialogue on East Asia early in the 2000s, before anyone was doing this, before there was right. Indo-Pacific. But, but anyway, the, the Quad is, um, um, I think, is a great initiative. And get, getting back to the, the communications uh, issue, is look, the first thing is, as David said, the message, um, which is, it's not just the, the mode. We'll get to the mode in a second, but it has to be strategic. You have to have strategic communication. You have to know what you're trying to say and what you're trying to achieve in doing so. So that messaging and being strategic is very, very important as, as we go forward. But yes, there are new, new ways of reaching out. When I was ambassador in, in, uh, in Burma, when I first arrived, there, were, there was no uh, connectivity. They were just not connected to the, the internet at all. Um, by the time I left, we had gotten these, um, uh, these polls up. Um, you know, we, we had gotten connected. And we were the third or fourth most followed embassy in the world on Facebook. And maybe people know that Burma is a Facebook country. Everybody considers the internet to be Facebook or Facebook to be the internet. Uh, we use that strategically. We would put messages, I mean, thinking through what are the messages they needed to hear. We would push it over Facebook and we were able to get, you know, tens of thousands of people, if not more, hearing what we had to say um, in an efficient way. Unfortunately, we found very quickly that the bad guys knew how to use this too and subvert the information space to promote hate and disinformation. So we have to be careful both to play defense and to play offense. Uh, I don't believe in censorship. I, don't, I think you have to overwhelm the bad information with good, but we have to be working with the companies to ensure that these platforms are geared towards democratic speech and to conversation and to fact 
rather than than disinformation. Uh, you get of the we see demographics in Africa, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia um, that are skewing young, and they're getting their information in different ways. Um, and we have to be catering if we're going to be smart about investing in, in our relationships going forward, we have to be invest, investing in those modes of communication to develop um, new alliances, new partnerships, uh, and new ways of connecting with, with other, other people. And in my realm, the democracy realm, where you're thinking about where the hope is for democracy, it's in the young people who are going out in the streets demanding a voice, and they are using these tools. Uh, they are the foot soldiers for democracy and for uh, maybe even these relationships over time. So I think we have to do much more, as you say, to think about how do we message to them where they are to be more effective in, uh, in, in investing in our relationships going forward. Thank you for that. General, I'd love to get your thoughts on this too, but you know, one of the things I like to try and do when we have discussions about something of this sort is to also look at what our peers are doing abroad. And you know, with the question, you know, to what degree are, are Russia and China uh, investing in new methods of social media. I mean, we've talked a lot about regular warfare, little green men and, you know, whatever is going on in the edge of Ukraine, but um, also uh, uh, new hybrid change things. And I'm just interested in your sense of the U.S. military and the U.S. national security apparatus writ large, what all that means is, you know, as you look at this, are we nimble enough? Are we the British redcoats in the forest with the American you know, running around uh, uh, the, the British, you know, in, in, in the woods irregularly. I'm just sort of interested in whether our formalities are tripping us up. Yeah, I'm not sure whether, whether the red coats or not, but I'll come back to that. But let me, let me jump on a, on a comment that you just made. I really agree with this idea on the importance of the message. Uh, that, that, is, that is absolutely critical, but equally as critical or, or very close afterwards is the idea of speed and agility on, uh, in, in messaging and in information sharing. This, I think, is, is an area where we do have some real challenges with, uh, and whether it is, it is through the authority process or the approval processes with this, this is an area, we, this is an area where we have to compete, and in order to compete, we have to we have to be acting out there. So it's one thing to have a really great message that you're getting out there, but it's another thing I think to actually be interacting out there to respond to what somebody says in, in response to your message, and then having the, the speed and the agility to uh, to actually uh, actually respond on that. I you know as so you, you brought up the U.S. Information Agency a little bit earlier. I mean, I, they, having done some, I'm not a diplomat, I wasn't in that, but I have done a lot of reading on this. And, you know, at the end of the Cold War, we had become quite adept at responding quickly to what the Soviets were putting out there and, and beating it back uh, in, 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 in the sources that, uh, uh, that we had. I, I do think to your, to your question that this is, an, this is an area where we have, got to keep, uh, we have got to keep moving forward. I think we have made extraordinary progress in this area, but we have a long way to go. I think back to the 2014 timeframe when we were trying to figure out how do we address ISIS use of, uh, of Facebook, of Twitter, of all these other social media uh, platforms they had for recruiting and information and for their own information activities. And, and it, was a, it was a pickup game, uh, frankly, where we brought military to, to it, then eventually we brought intelligence community to it, then we brought law enforcement community to it, then we brought our international partners and allies to it. Uh, but it was a, it was a pickup game uh, in terms of how we were doing it. Now we became very effective, you know. Within a within eighteen months, two years, we were we had we were pushing ISIS off of their off of Twitter and and other platforms they use, and really making things difficult for us. Uh, but the challenges that we are dealing with today, with countries like China and Russia, who are much more sophisticated about this, we we, we will not have the ability to play to to pick up things along the way. We have got to be much more focused in this. We have got to be developing the capabilities in a way that allows us to not only have great messages, but be also be able to, to move with speed and agility um, to, uh, to do it. So I think we've got a, we've got a lot to do. You, you can't travel around the Middle East, any of the big cities without seeing signs for Chinese uh, 
construction companies and the and the things that they have under the, the, the message is ubiquitous mm -hmm. uh, across there and we have got to get out there not just in social media but in all forms uh, we have got to compete in this environment and and I'm afraid that uh, we we are not at least to the degree that we need and I think we're relying on our ability to have a great pickup game when when uh, when push comes to shove on this uh, and I don't think we can with uh, with the adversaries and the competitors that we're dealing with today just in our next few minutes, I, I would just love to get from everyone um, another side. You know, imagining again, you know, not to, to to make too much of this, but if John McCain were on the panel, I think he would talk a lot about cases where you know irregular methods, you know, channels that went around the system did help. But he would always raise. He would also raise times it didn't. I mean, I talked to Senator McCain numerous times about our mistakes with North Korea, mm -hmm. and I don't think he was angrier about many things than Jimmy Carter's last minute mission to North Korea before America was allegedly going to make a preemptive strike on its nuclear program. And his comment is history would be very, very different today had Jimmy Carter been blocked or had not made that mission. And, and I think Jimmy Carter's mission to North Korea fits very much in that. And I know, um, uh, David, you've talked about how, uh, at least with me, on how irregular diplomacy can be used to stop mass atrocities and war crimes, but but can it also get in the way of things that end up themselves becoming, you know, big 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 problems like you know a major North Korea nuclear program? David, well, I, I mean, I think context is everything, so it's hard to answer that question in 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 broad terms. But yeah, can can sort of parallel track or non governmental engagement make things more complicated for government? Sure, I mean. I had the privilege of working and knowing Senator McCain, and, and I think that you know, were he here, he would be emphasizing the need of the U.S. government, in particular, to always be standing with and creating space for those in um, society and civil society who are being cracked down upon and space to operate is being absolutely being targeted. And so, you know, just reflecting back on our last conversation, which I completely agree with the comments that Ambassador Mitchell and General Bodel made. You know, it's not, it's also just not always technology. Like it just has to be political will. And it's not the easiest thing when you're a bilateral ambassador in capital to, you know, convene a meeting with a bunch of dissidents um, that are, that's gonna create problems for you in terms of your dialogue with the Minister of Foreign Affairs the next day on the bilateral issues. But I think, you know, you invoke Senator McCain. I think part of the effort here has to be that we see ourselves as defenders of institutions and of, of values um, mm. and the value of, of, of democracy being chief amongst them, in addition to and in complement to the bilateral relationship we may be preserving and responsible for protecting. And so there can be tensions in that dynamic. And those are the tensions that we have to just prioritize. Um, you know, we have to, in my view, we have to prioritize people and the consequences that these institutions have on people and ensure that America is always creating space for people to advance human dignity and, and freedom. All right, Joe? Uh, you know, I, I, I think I agree with, uh, with my colleagues here in, in terms of where they where they are with this, I mean, it certainly is a it's a great uh, is a great way of as, as suggested here creating some space and some decision space for 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 everybody in, in terms of these things. I, I the the I, as we we're talking about this, I, I I'm thinking about uh, you know examples from my own experience, particularly with uh, special envoys uh, mm -hmm. and how that is all all gone. I don't I don't know where that fits on the perspective of regular versus irregular or, or whatever. But, you know, it's certainly, I, I, that is an area where I've had a lot of examples uh, or a lot of experience, uh, you know, certainly in Syria, but in other places. And in some cases, almost functioning as, a, as somewhat of that myself. So, you know, for example, one of the things that I was trying to do was working with the UN Special Envoy for Yemen, Martin Griffiths. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, a UN representative, trying to provide advice, trying to provide perspective, trying to uh, use my relationship with other members of the Arab-led coalition to, uh, to explain to them what he was attempting to do. Uh, uh, and and uh, while I, I think it 
may have felt good to him, to Mr. Griffiths in terms of that. I, I don't know that I was wholly, wholly effective in terms of that. I think by, by virtue of the fact that this continues to be an intractable problem for us, I think it's, it is, the answer is, is very evident there. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, so I, I, I mean, I think there are opportunities for this to be successful, but I also think there, we have to be very, very mindful of that in some areas this just will not, will not produce. General, before I jump to, to Derek, um, are there are there opportunities out there that that President Biden is looking at that you would see the use of an envoy like you or an envoy to solve some problems, to kind of send some clear messages? Are there, are there any that pop for you that you think stand right out there at front front? And I'll go to Derek and, and we can close this up. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if there if, if there are. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of limited by my own experience here. I mean, I, I think, for example, the envoys that we had in place in Syria, I think actually were for, for, for the military, I think we're quite happy. We had, you know, Mr. McGurk, we had Bill Roebuck on the ground. I mean, these are superior the diplomats who are doing great, great stuff. And, you know, uh, and I think we're very, very well nested with us. Unfortunately, I don't think uh, the strategic objectives that we were really uh, pursuing there uh, came to fruition during the times they were in. So, you know, I guess we can question, uh, question some of that. I, I guess the one thing I would just say, since you gave me a little opening here with the new administration, is that, you know, I think one of the most important things that the new administration could do is make sure that we actually do have confirmed ambassadors in all of the countries in the Middle East. And seven of the 18 countries in, uh, in, uh, in that area when I left command, only seven of the 18 had confirmed ambassadors. Now the Chargés were, were wonderful, dedicated Americans doing a great job, but they did not carry the weight of an ambassador. And uh, and they did not ha always have the backing back in the back in the Department of the State uh, to provide the kind of the back office piece addressing that particular problem, I think, is very achievable in the relative near term and is something that I think can make a pretty big, uh, pretty big difference. That's traditional. But it, to me, it would it would be really, really important. It would send a very clear signal to those countries. Thank you for that. Derek Mitchell. Well, just to build on that, that's called regular envoys. Yeah, they're not special. We need regular envoys. We need our mm -hmm. we need to staff up the State Department again. We need to staff up our embassies around the world. Uh, we need to get people out there. Um, that's absolutely essential before you have uh, so you don't have to have so many specials. I have to say I was a special right. I was first before I was ambassador in Burma. I was a special envoy, as it were, a special rep to Burma, um, and that was meant just because this issue was so fraught and it needed. I thought it needed uh, to be. Uh, coordinated. I actually called for it to be the position to be created in a foreign affairs piece, and I took the job, which is a pretty good model to take. Uh, but <laughs> I also was calling recently for a new special envoy, frankly, for the current situation in, in Burma, uh, to be different than the previous version. This current version, I suggested, be created for someone to go around Asia and to sort of light a fire under folks. Uh, to suggest urgency. Special envoys are symbolic as well as practical. They send a signal mm -hmm. this issue is of unique seriousness to the US government and that we can't through the usual bureaucratic process give it the attention that perhaps the 24 seven attention it deserves with everything going else uh, on in the world. So um, I think for both symbolic reasons and, and very practical ones now when it comes to what I consider um, an under motive uh, or a uh, not motivated enough reaction in Asia to a uh, potential failed state in the heart of that region, that there should be a special envoy to go to those capitals and work on this. So that was my view on something needed currently. Thank you for that. And, and, and da um, David, because I gave uh, the general and, and ambassador an opportunity to talk about you know, Joe Biden's, you know, openings in this, you know, I'd love to just get a quick snapshot from you on whether you think there's anything in the irregular diplomacy sandbox that Joe Biden might be, you know, that you would advise him to take a look at. I mean, look, I, I think that President Biden and Secretary Blinken are going to use every tool at their disposal to try and navigate what is a very, very uncertain moment um, with a whole lot of complexity. And so I don't think anyone is sort of going to be looking at 
this from the rubric of is this traditional, is this regular, is this irregular, they're going to be looking at it as they should from what is the best mechanism by which the United States can advance our values and our interests and advance peace and security. And I think that's exactly the right approach. And I would just underscore what General Vodal and Ambassador Mitchell said about the real need to staff up the State Department. I mean, it really, it really has gone through an incredibly difficult time and, and we really do need it. Well, listen, I wanna thank uh, all three of you for a wonderful conversation on irregular diplomacy and what it is. I've learned a lot. I hope our audience has as well. I uh, wanna thank very much General Joe Vodal, uh, uh, Ambassador Derek Mitchell and Ambassador David Pressman. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you.